So, you know, silver and gold have had huge runs on all of this uncertainty. We've had a huge gold uh, with everything going on in the world. And it, you know, what's, what's your take on this? Is this, is this a short term uh, invasion related run up or to be, or should, is this part of the longer term continuation of the bull market? It may be a trigger. Um, in my experience in the gold market, which goes back to 1971, uh, runs in precious metals that are due to geopolitical fears are usually very short-lived. Mm. Runs in precious metals that are due to investors' and consumers' fears of the efficacy of their purchasing power in fiat-denominated instruments are permanent. People often use current events to allow themselves psychologically to do something that they were otherwise going to be going to do. And I suspect that some part of the hyperbolic move that you see in that chart is the fact that people have wanted to participate in the gold market. Uh, they looked at the wedge that you can see so obviously there, but they were concerned about the timing and, and that the Russian invasion gave them the psychological stimulus, the psychological permission to do yeah. something that they had already wanted to do. But in my experience, uh, relying on geopolitical tension as a catalyst for higher precious metals markets uh, hasn't worked. So, Rick, you know, your other favorite topic after silver, we know Phil Silver is your top favorite topic, but after silver, you're well known for your, your knowledge and expertise on uranium. Russia is a huge player in the uranium market. Why is uranium now ri rising? And what should well, we I'd be aware say, of? I'd say there's three factors. One is the primary factor. Russia is a fairly good sized uranium producer. Uh, obviously, it's going to be difficult for them to ship fuel and even more difficult for them to get paid for the fuel they ship. But more importantly, Russia is responsible for more than 40% of the enrichment uh, uh, capacity worldwide. The ability to turn spent fuel rods into uh, fresh fuel rods is a Russian business. And that capacity, if you will, has gone to capacity heaven. Shipping spent fuel into Russia, receiving recycled rods from Russia, paying the Russians for the work obviously has been interrupted. This is massively disruptive. But the most massive disruption, I think, goes to energy security. The world relies on Russian uranium. Yes, the world relies on Russian coal. The world relies on Russian oil and gas, particularly the Europeans. And the increase in prices that we're seeing for oil and gas and the realization uh, that stable sources of energy uh, are required means that many of the places in the world that thought that they could afford to turn off nuclear power are rethinking that. Even Germany, which mm. is the... The, the most prominent of the nuclear refusers post Fukushima said yesterday that current circumstances mean that they need to rethink their policy of shutting their, down the rest of their nuclear fleet. The most important outcome for the uranium business, however, is that this will add uh, an extra incentive to the Japanese to increase the pace of Japanese restarts. You'll recall that the Japanese nuclear industry shut down post Fukushima. They have now restarted something like 10 or 12 nuclear reactors, but 18 are in for permitting. Japanese public began to find favor in uranium two years ago as a consequence of Japan's Kyoto Protocol uh, promises and the fact that they could never meet their Kyoto Protocol guidance or clean up their own air, generating power by burning oil and by burning coal. But the whole specter of energy security is what drove the Japanese to the nuclear business in the beginning, in the early part of the 1970s, during the oil embargo. The fact is that in Japan, the energy shortfall has been made up by liquefied natural gas. And the price of seaborne liquefied natural gas in the, less, in the last six weeks is up by 300%, reinforcing to Japan an energy poor country that the only viable option they have for energy security is nuclear. You know, the enrichment thing really sort of strikes home. I know Kazakhstan, one of Russia's neighbors, is a huge mining producer of uh, uranium. Is I assume most of that then gets shipped to Russia for processing and turned into uranium fuel for nuclear power plants? Uh, the Kazakhs uh, have done a pretty good job of diversifying their supply chain, which is to say they ship a lot of yellow cake, including a lot of yellow cake right south of the border into China. Uh, but once these fat, once these rods, these fuel rods have been fabricated and they're custom, uh, 
uh, reactor by reactor by reactor. Uh, when you have drawn the energy discharge capability of the rod down below uh, critical levels, uh, those rods are often gathered uh, and shipped to a reprocessing facility where they're re-energized. And uh, over 40% of the world's capacity for that is in Russia. The uh, Kazakhs ha have not built up any substantial uh, enrichment capacity in Kazakhstan. Uh, they've, their own uh, uranium mining industry has consumed so much capital relative to the company's ability to, to uh, provide that capital that they've left that part of the supply chain uh, to the Russians. Uh, and that is obviously very, very interrupt interrupted now. Uh, oil and natural gas have not been, they've been left out of the sanctions because Europe needs them so much. One of the key things that we've noticed this week is that even though it's not sanctioned, traders are avoiding it. Um, it's impossible That's to get a, a tanker to, to go there because a lot of the shipping companies are avoiding Russia right now. Insurance companies won't insure shipments. Um, Correct. Ba banks won't provide lines of credit, even though they're not, it's just not worth the trouble. So even though they're not sanctioned, they're indirectly being sanctioned now by the market, correct? And for 40% of Russia's gas exports, uh, the VTOL pipeline goes through the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians might be <laughs> expected to object to that uh, somehow. So I think you're right. Uh, I think there are serious logistical uh, objections. There are serious logistical uh, uh, problems in investing in Russia, which I have done with mm -hmm. the interruption of the SWIFT banking system, one of the lovely things about Russian stocks was they paid lovely dividends. Uh, the Russians, even assuming that they had the will to pay me my dividends, don't have the means at present because they can't get dollars to pay me. Uh, I understand that my problems pale with the problems experienced by Ukrainians and Russians, but I just wanted to point, point out personally that this sort of disruption impacts everybody, even an old, fat, bald speculator from the United States. But are you familiar with uh, China does have a replacement for the, the SWIFT system, they call it SIPS. And uh, it's my understanding that's operational now in China, Russia, and even some European banks. Um, is that, you know, China's the manufacturing hub of the world. Do you think that's the way Russia just sort of ignores all this and gets around it? I don't think that they're able to ignore it and just get around it. I don't think that SIPS is a robust enough system. And I don't think that the renminbi and the ruble uh, are liquid enough currencies uh, mm -hmm. that this is a long-term solution. M many, many years ago, Jim, uh, I had uh, occasion to talk to the manager of a uh, Asian sovereign wealth fund uh, about their reliance on U.S. dollars and U.S. securities. Uh, and I made the remark that arithmetically the dollar felt like a lie. And I remember him saying to me, yes, a lie to be sure, a deep and liquid lie, unlike mm. all of the other lies that were, told, were, that were being told. And I, so I, I then pressed him a little bit. I said, do you trust us? And he said, oh, no, but we trust you much more than we trust each other. And I think the problem that will uh, occur as a consequence of this for the Russians, for the Chinese, for the Indians, for the people who rightly from their own point of view, would like to circumvent the extraterritorial application of US policy through SWIFT will be the uh, lack of fungibility on a global basis of their currencies and their profound distrust for each other. 